Good afternoon and welcome to Black Hat 2011. Uh, you're currently in the threat intelligence uh, track. Uh, we have Alex and Julia from FireEye who will be discussing the Rustock botnet. Okay. Um, oh, good morning, I mean, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so just a really, really quick announcement besides filling out your feedback form. Uh, if any of you knew Len Sassman, there, there'll be a memorial uh, Friday at DEF CON, uh, Friday night in one of the, uh, one of the um, Sky Talks rooms. So anyway, the, uh, so, the, uh, uh, so Alex and I are going to tag team on this, basically. Uh, and, uh, uh, and basically, the, for the next uh, hour or so, we're pretty much going to cover uh, similar similar bo spam botnets and uh, and some of the history of, of Rustock as well as the uh, the current takedown uh, that Microsoft did earlier this year. So I guess uh, Alex will probably take over from this point. Sure. So I'm gonna get started. So my name's Alex. I'm a FireEye. Um, wow, these mics work pretty well. And if you need a laser pointer. Sure. Um, so all these people couldn't get into Kaminsky's talk. That's a little yeah, surprised. Nice. But uh, yeah, so obviously not a marketing presentation, but I do, I do want to talk real quickly about the way that people typically got in, 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 infected with, uh, with Rustock and with other bots that are kind of similar to it, and with some of the small intricacies that were built into Rustock to make each different step of the infection lifecycle work a little bit better. Um, but I don't think it's really any, any surprise to anybody that people get infected either via the web or via email today. You know, there's certainly a small percentage of malware that comes in via USB stick or you know, other infection means. But for the most part, you're getting infected through some sort of drive-by download or some sort of email attachment, right? It's attacking either the browser or the browser infrastructure, PDF, Flash, Office, QuickTime, RealPlayer, all the plugins that sit inside a browser that enterprises are very bad at patching, and home users are even worse. Um, so because of that, that's where they've, that's where they've gone after. Um, and then, you know, once the exploit comes in, obviously the only thing browser-based malware does, or the only thing exploits do for in, the, in, the, in the realm of browser-based malware is download and run an executable. So it doesn't matter if it's a PDF exploit or a JavaScript exploit or a whatever. For the most part, for the most part, the only thing the shell code does is download and run an executable. Uh, and then once they have you know, persistence on the system, they're going to beacon out to remote command and control. So that's the whole exploit lifecycle. So you, you, you probably think, OK, well, botnet takedowns aren't that hard. right? All you need to do is gather up all the malware for the, same, for the same family, right? If you pick a DDoS bot or you pick a spam bot or you take a data stealer, if you have access to massive amounts of malware, which most AV companies, most security companies do, you know, either from your customers or from a commercial source, you can gather up all the malware and then track down the command and control and then take it down, right? Talk to people, say, hey, that's bad. You got to stop doing that. And the, the bot goes away, right? Well. That's, that's kind of what I thought um, at one point. You think that, in general, people want to do the right thing, whether it's a domain registrar or registry, or maybe it's some sort of ISP or hosting center. If you're providing good data, they'll act on it. Um, and that's true in the US, which we can see in Rustock. But I want to show an example of Grum, which is another like top three spam bot that I tried to take down a couple of years ago, and it didn't work. And I'll, I'll talk about why it didn't work. and actually the harm it created because I like failed at taking it down. Um, but you know, Grum's a huge bot, you know, hundreds of thousands of nodes, sends billions of spams per day. Depending what stats you look at, you know, what, what anti-spam vendor, whether it's Ironport or whether it's Semantic or whoever it is, you know, everyone has kind of a different way of measuring spam, but it's always in the top couple spam bots worldwide. Um, and just like Rustock, the command and control for Grum never changed. Um, well, why do we call it Grum? We call it Grum because the bad guys called it Grum, the criminal. Um, so in the actual downloader that pulled down the initial infection, he was calling it getgrum.php, which is why the whole industry calls it Grum. Um, naming malware is always kind of interesting. Everyone has a different name. But in the case of this, this is pretty much what everybody calls it. Um, so that's kind of how we started. We, we started tracking the, um, the downloads of this, because that's kind of how you have to do your research, right? You can't reverse engineer something you don't have. So you figure out the characteristics it's using to pull down the malware, and you gather up you know, hundreds or preferably thousands or tens of thousands of samples of the malware, and you start running it. 
Right, so when we started running Grum, this was in like 2009, um, hopefully it's big enough, yeah, we noticed that the vast majority of the command and control servers existed in two major net blocks. Um, but then when you dig deeper those net blocks, when you look at routing charts, you look at advertisements or whatever, you saw that those prefixes were only being advertised by one data center. And that was this data center called Steep Post. And these guys still exist. So this is naive me. This is a couple years ago me. I said, okay, well, you know, I've, I've got, I know exactly where the command and control is. It's obviously one group supporting this botnet, right? I should be able to turn this over to all the upstream providers or to the data center or to whoever, and they'll take it down, right? Well, they don't. They don't. Um, so I put on my fire hat and I sent this nice official email and I, 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 sent, them, I sent them all the Grum stuff. You know, I sent them all the information about, uh, yeah. I sent them all the information about that specific box. It was really evident that all this was there. But they also were hosting, you know, generic malware. They were hosting, you know, link crawlers that were doing, like, forum spam. They were hosting, uh, you know, all, all that chat. So I wrote this really nice Word doc, and I sent it to their upstream provider, um, data group or something like that. And I got no response back. Well, so I, I took it. And then I sent it to Data Group's upstream provider, Global Crossing. And I got a little bit of a response. And they said, oh, thank you very much for your automated abuse report. Someone will take advantage, or someone will take note of this. Um, so they took a few of the IPs and they put in slash 23 null routes. It wasn't on the whole subnet. It was just on a very selective number of the IPs. Um, and that basically made it so that if you're going through that route, you weren't going to be able to get to it. So you can see that I just incremented the IP by one in the trace route, and I was able to get to it, right? So just very, you know, specific null routes. So what do, what do the bad guys do? What do, what do Steep Post do? Well, they say, okay, well, I'm going to get a backup provider so that if someone's null routing my connections, so before this is what the connection looked like, all their traffic went through data group, and when a null route was being placed actually on Global Crossing to go through data group, um, they got a backup provider to, to just for a little bit of resiliency. And it kind of makes sense that they would want to do that anyway because you want to have a dual home network. But they weren't before. But with a little bit of pressure, it forced them to go and buy more connectivity. Was that good? No, not really. It really didn't have any operational effect in terms of overall spam on the internet. You know, the computers are still infected. It put them out of business for like maybe half an hour. Um, but because these guys are like in a legitimate data center, they're in like, it's kind of like a peering point or like an internet exchange. They had access to all these other, you know, tier one or tier two internet providers, so they just buy transit from other people. Um, and then worse than that, they started adding multiple levels of obfuscation to their command and control servers. So this is what the bot talked like at the time. It doesn't look like this anymore, and I'll get into that. But this is what the bot talked like at the time. When you, when you connect and you knew what page to go to, it would give you this unique ID and then this ID would be used as a key to do the obfuscation or like bad encryption for the command and control. But if you hit the command and control server directly, it would throw up this fake musician's friend website. And they were actually like iframing it to musician's friend. So they, you know, they, they went back, Steepost went back to their upstreams and said, oh yeah, you know, I guess the, the computers got compromised. I'm guessing what they said, right? I guess the computer got compromised and, you know, see, it's really a legitimate site. You know, it wasn't, it's not command and control. But at the same time, they were, you know, still, still an active CNC. Um, and they did it with a, a bunch of the other CNCs. So this happened, like, hours after the null route. Like, they were clearly watching exactly what was going on. Um, and so this is a fake blog, but it's the same, same principle. If you connect the way the command and control ex expects to, you can still talk to it. But then a few weeks later, they got freaked a little bit. So they had, they had used that old command and control structure that, like, get spam ID, like, very clear in the, in the UI for a long time, like, a year, a year and a half. And they've actually subsequently sold off that code base, or at least shared it with someone else. Um, so what they did is they changed their command and control structure. So now everyone who had written snort signatures for what the old bot looked like, those didn't work anymore. And they changed it to this, like, fairly innocuous-looking uh, UI, or, or URL, rather, um, and they started embedding the command and control inside the user agent field. So all those snort signatures just didn't work anymore, and the bot was still up. So was this successful? 
no, it was like a pretty big failure, right? Um, so so that's, that's all I'm showing here, is that the, now it's all embedded inside the user agent. And this is what it looks like today, right? It's still a top, pardon? Oh, so, yeah. oh no, I guess uh, I'm not supposed to ask questions. Uh, you can ask questions if you feel like that. You can shout it out. I don't, I don't really care. But uh, the command and control is now embedded inside the, the user agent. So it's not like particularly super sophisticated, but it was good enough to defeat all the standard mechanisms that, mechanisms that people had put in place to, uh, to detect that bot. Uh, Ukraine, no, yeah, it's based in the Ukraine. I'll repeat the question. Oh yeah, so he, he had asked, it. I'd, I'd kind of made a distinction about you know, good ISPs and bad ISPs and good registrars and registries and bad ones. And in this case, I mean, it looks like they own a whole bunch of the infrastructure. So if you can fake being a legitimate data center, right? If you tell your upstream that, oh yeah, I'm a data center, I have lots of customers, you can kind of pass the buck and say, oh yeah, it wasn't me doing this bad stuff, it was one of my customers. Oh yeah, I'll go tell my customer to go clean it up because he had some vulnerable WordPress installation that led to him getting compromised. It's obviously actually the guy who owns the data center. Um, yeah, so then they changed up their obfuscation a little bit. So now if you wget, and again, I just did this like yesterday, if you wget the, the new command and control, it gives you a 404 back. But if you connect the way the bot expects, which has like the proper user agent and what the encryption key should be, then it sends you down the encrypted command and control. So it's, it's a little naive to think that you can just collect all the data about the bot and then hand it off to the people who provide them access and have it do anything. It unfortunately isn't, isn't quite that easy. All right. So Julia's gonna talk a little bit about some of the early Rustock stuff and then I'll get back into it. All right, so um, the, Rustock was first named uh, in about 2000 by Symantec and the, in the long tradition of no two antivirus companies ever calling a piece of malware by the same name, it, it was also known as uh, Costrad and RK Rustock and some other stuff. Um, initially, it was, it was a very different sort of uh, uh, bot at the time. It, it used RSC at the time, uh, IRC for its CNC at the time, which is fairly common in 2006. And uh, the CNCs were on the Russian business network along with many other botnets at the time. Um, it, uh, it also just, um, rather than having its own SMTP engine, it just had a SOX proxy. And uh, the, the CNC would li like literally just send through the SOX proxy on the on the victim machine uh, to, to whatever CNC and stuff like that. It's, um, it did some, some of the fairly old fashioned uh, rootkit type tricks. So um, it, it slowly evolved a bit. About, about 2007, it, uh, it switched to using HTTP for its CNC communications and it switched to being a template based spam bot. Would, uh, uh, so for template based, um, basically doing your own SMTP through a proxy is rather slow and inefficient. So uh, what the CNC does is it hands a, uh, like a mail merge type template to the bot that, and a list of email addresses and says, uh, send this email to this list of email addresses and fill in the blanks appropriately and stuff. So it's, uh, it's a lot more efficient because then you've got a million, you've paralyzed your, uh, your sending by about a million fold or whatever the size of the botnet is at the time. Um, anyway, it was, it was uh, initially propagated via uh, uh, since, uh, spam messages where it would be some sensational subject line and, uh, you, know, you know, click here for this news story about whatever crazy thing and, and a lot of people would fall for it and it would basically run the program uh, and, and install itself. There was, a, uh, there was also a number of drive-by exploit done as well where you basically look at some, you, would, you end up in some web page Exploits your browser, shellcode downloads this executable, runs the installer. Uh, fairly standard stuff. Um, around this time, too, it was, it was uh, Rustock, a lot of the spam was sending out was also uh, using, claiming to be from Microsoft as a very sort of advanced fee um, scams, where it's like, oh, we've won this, this prize from Microsoft. Uh, send us all of your personal information so that we can uh, send you this prize money. Kind of a kind of a thing, uh, a lot of uh, Viagra spam and uh, and so forth. And interestingly enough, uh, Joe Stewart actually did this really great analysis uh, of some of the uh, the penny stock scam that was sending out at the time. Uh, it, it looks kind of like this. Um, anyway, you, you get this you get this email, and, and Joe was like, 
who on earth would, who on earth would, would fall for this? So, uh, but he, but he uh, actually went and looked at the stock price uh, for, this, for this stock, and uh, he found that uh, this is basically when the spam campaign went out. Uh, like, literally, like, the stock price, like, jumped. And, uh, and even if, I mean, I mean, like, who would buy, you know, who would buy stock based on recommendation from a spam but it, a message? But it, uh, it may just be that everybody kind of knows it's kind of shady, but they figured they could pro maybe they they think they can get money out of it before the stock price drops or something. I know it's the, the greater fool theory, I guess, from, from uh, stock trading or whatever. Uh, there was also, uh, oops. But also actually, uh, Joe Stewart actually got, uh, got his uh, site DDoSed for a while because of, uh, uh, because of this um, research he published. Uh, the, uh, the advanced fee uh, Microsoft type things look like this. It's like, your email is when you have one million great British pounds and blah, 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 blah. You know, typical, you know, 419 scam stuff. So, um, so in 2008, uh, after the, the infamous Russian business network had, uh, had gone down, um, a lot, many of the uh, CNCs were hosted at Intercage uh, until it went down in, in September of 2008. And then, uh, and then uh, after that, uh, almost just about all of them were actually hosted at Mikolo, which uh, was de peered in November of 2008. And that's another long story. Uh, the, there were uh, several botnets like uh, Sarisby uh, that were also hosted at Mikolo. It was, it was like literally the, the entire uh, AS range was, was nothing but with CNC servers and like uh, spam advertisement hosting and stuff like that. Um, the uh, um, so yeah, we we uh, ended up actually, we took this opportunity to actually hijack this, the Srisby botnet and, and permanently shut it down, but we didn't quite get it all done for uh, for Rustock. So uh, this is we we hijacked part of the the Rustock uh, CNCs during this period, and and uh, this is about where we plotted most of the uh, incoming bots coming from at the time. So. Uh, there's only a partial data, though, but... Right, so the, so the idea is that, you know, <clears throat> when McCola was still up, all these yeah. bots, you know, they, the backup mechanisms were kind of evolving. Some had static, IP, static domain names yeah. built in, some had these kind of first-generation domain generation algorithms where they would, uh, they would generate a certain number of names based on the... Time. Based on the time, yeah, which is really popular now, but back then it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so what we found was that when the Rustock command and control mm -hmm. servers went down, um, they had a bunch of backup names that weren't registered. So all we did was just register them very quickly. So we were able to get like a pretty brief insight into the bot. Uh, yep. Yeah, and that's, what, that's where the data from this is from. Um, we did the similar trick for, oh, what was the question? Uh, I think it's the size of the, uh, actually, what did, yeah, um, what did, what is the? CNC, yeah. Okay, the red ones were CNCs, okay. So, yeah, I guess most of the hosting, yeah, McCullough was in San Jose at the time. But, and it's been like some other data that was mixed in. But, uh, so yeah, it was, uh, so Rustock was using hard coded IPs at the time. Uh, and a couple, some, of the, some of the versions of Rustock actually did have a backup set of DNS names, but uh, so a bunch of them didn't. Uh, however, um, on like Saturday, uh, after, after the, the uh, initial takedown, uh, McCullough, uh, I guess, uh, made use of their backup peer agreement with uh, uh, Telia in Sweden. And for about 12 hours, the uh, IP block was routable again. And so the, the people uh, operating uh, Rustock took the opportunity to push out, quickly push out an update to all of the, box, all of the uh, bots that, that did still connect the IP range to uh, point them to a new server in uh, Russia. And uh, anyway, 2009, more of the same. And uh, just kind of sending more and more and more spam. It was, it was, I think it actually ended up being uh, 2009 is when it finally like hit, uh, hit being uh, the the majority of of source of all spam on Earth. So uh, you were actually going to mention on the uh, X on the X encryption stuff. Yeah, yeah. So so the, the whole the Aurora, which I'm sure everybody has heard about and was wildly overmarketed in 2009, and certainly continues to be overmarketed. Um, what was interesting about that attack was that it used something that wasn't next-gen then, 
but it was certainly not used very widely. And that was using some sort of encryption, really obfuscation, built into the initial shell code so that when the shell code executes and it calls URL download file A or URL download cache file W or something, it pulls down a file and that file is obfuscated. So this is the first stage downloader. This isn't like an exe that exists and it's going to pull down over SSL. This is basic obfuscation that's built into the shell code so that when it, when it brings down the exe, it's encrypted. And the only reason you would ever do this is to defeat some sort of network-based device that's generically watching for like a PE header, right? Looking for MZ, extracting to the end of the TCP flow, and then reconstructing it. That's really the only reason you'd do this on the network layer. Because to the host, it's going to get reconstituted to an executable um, just as if it was downloaded directly. So Aurora did this two years ago. Um, and unfortunately, it was not the first. Yeah, it was, not, it was definitely not the first time. Yeah. But it wasn't w very widely used. You know, the, the concept was around, but really only in, in targeted attacks. Um, but now what you see is um, essentially Rustock doing the exact same thing, which I'll, I'll talk about in a sec. Um, but uh, you know, a few years ago in like the, the Macolo days, the pay per install infrastructure was really just kind of coming up to speed. It, it, again, it existed, but it wasn't as prevalent as it is today. Um, and Rustock was distributed almost entirely through the paper install mechanism. So the initial shell code executes, it downloads a file, and all that file does is go and download other files. Right? The, the, that executable doesn't have any real functionality built into it um, except to go and download other files. So from a dynamic perspective, from an analysis perspective, these downloaders have been really effective because they're not doing heuristically strange things to the desktop. Right, when, you, when you pull down one of these downloaders, and there's obviously exceptions, but for the most part, they're not like hooking anything in kernel mode, they're not escalating privileges, they're not generating a whole bunch of outbound connections. All they're doing, they, they'll come with like a, a couple of URLs, sometimes a text file, and they'll just reach out and download things and run them. Um, so that gives them a lot more flexibility because they can put 1,000 URLs into one of these things, and they only need one to get through. Right, so that's kind of how they're able to be so be so successful. And there have been a bunch of services that have popped up to support this. Um, and there's whole teams of people that all they do is install software for other people. Um, so Gangsta Bucks is down now. It's, it, it's, it's not around because it got too popular. So I pulled this off uh, Brian Krebs' blog. Uh, but uh, Chris Greer from UCB had, had also sent this to me um, after I'd posted something about Rustock on, on our corporate blog. And he said, oh, yeah, well, all that Rustock stuff is, is being downloaded directly by, by Piptia, which is the downloader pushed out by Gangstabox, um, which we, we'd kind of known, but it's all, always nice to get third-party validation from people. Um, but interestingly, when Rustock, when that, when that downloader, when Piptia was downloading subsequent files, in the case of Rustock, it was downloading encrypted files. So it's not just interesting that it's downloading something encrypted. It's that not only was it downloading things that were encrypted, so in this case, Rustock was coming down as this password-protected RAR, which I'll talk about. It's that that initial downloader had to know how to decrypt this, right? So a standalone executable pulling down the encrypted piece, you have to know how to decrypt it, right? How to run it. You know, and you might see a fake JPEG header, so it knows, okay, skip the first 200 bytes and then extract it. Or it could be uh, some binary blob and it say XORs it by 55 and skip null bytes. Or you know, there's a whole bunch of different obfuscation techniques. But that initial executable is downloading Rustock, encrypted. But it was also downloading a whole bunch of other stuff, like Gbot and like other fake AV and other things that that are were built into the very same downloader executable, which kind of makes a connection between Rustock and some of this other crap that they were, they were actually pushing out, like fake AV software. Um, so just the, the connections you can draw between what was built into some of those downloaders and some of the malware families they were fetching are interesting. Uh, but anyway, but I talked about how it pulls down this fake RAR file. Um, they did something interesting on the downloaded file, which would never be seen by a human, right? There's no, if you're on a desktop, you're never going to see this stuff coming down. This is only to defeat other network-based people. So network-based tools that are watching for executables, or in this case, they're watching for RAR files, they would see this, and what they're trying to do is throw them off the trail. So they'd actually call this RAR file, which is like two steps into yeah. the infection process, 
um, my backup 21 or my photos or photo 21 or backup.rar, they would name the RAR files something completely innocuous. So if you were a network guy, like if you were an analyst at some big company or you just were watching network data, watching for statistically interesting things or heuristically interesting things, if you see this RAR file come down, and let's even say you extract it, right? You extract this file called my backup 21, and you try to open it, and it ends up being password protected. So it's, it's not just that you would think, oh, you know, that's, well, I can't tell what it is. You're probably going to go in the opposite direction. You're probably going to say, okay, well, it's completely reasonable that someone password protects their RAR file, even though RARs are maybe a little weird. They password protect their RAR file if it's called my backups. So they think in the other direction, like, oh, yeah, it's probably legit. I'm probably not going to look into this. Um, so the only reason you would have built that type of obfuscation into it is if you were trying to throw off network-based analysts. So um, anyway, so yeah, like I was saying, the, uh, if, you, if you grab one of these RAR files and, and uh, try and uh, just even look at the metadata in it, you know, you probably prefer a password, and, and nothing will ever work. Uh, and uh, the, uh, one of the interesting f features about the RAR file format is that it's a solid archive where all of the uh, metadata uh, is, all, is basically included with the compressed data and uh, also encrypted all at once. So, um, so RAR doesn't actually, RAR, the only way RAR knows is this actually a RAR file is by looking at the, the initial header and then just kind of trying uh, passwords and stuff like that or trying to see if, a CR, if the CRC will work after decryption. So uh, this is, this is what one of the actual uh, uh, Rust doc samples uh, as the update came down uh, encrypted. Uh, as you can see, it's got a regular RAR header and then white noise. Uh, when you actually de decode it, it, uh, it ends up looking like this. It's, it's a regular Windows this kernel device driver. And uh, the crypto they used was, uh, it's fairly, fairly simplistic. Uh, it, uh, the key is actually stored in the file, which is actually not that uncommon for a lot of these uh, uh, homemade uh, crypto algorithms. Uh, the, uh, there basically, it's a four-byte key, and you, uh, you do some math on it. Basically, you add it with a, a constant, and then you just take the least significant byte of the key and XOR it with the least significant byte of the, uh, the encoded data, and that's your output byte. Uh, and then basically, the, the, the four-byte key is just permutated in various ways to uh, essentially get the, uh, the next byte for the stream. Um, anyway, so uh, I think that was about 2009, I guess. So, uh, in 2010, the, uh, the other interesting developments were that it, uh, Rustic seemed to have gone on vacation uh, over Christmas, and nobody exactly knows why. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, there, there was a, I mean, there was a noticeable drop in spam back in October last year when uh, Spamit uh, went down. That, that was basically the Canadian pharmacy affiliate program thing that, uh, that was where Rustic got most of its money from, I guess, apparently, um, was basically sending sending spam on behalf of that uh, whole group and stuff like that. But it was, uh, the way that the, the affiliate thing worked was basically if you, if you, it was basically a way of getting, contacting, um, you know, purveyors of uh, imitation pharmaceuticals with uh, operators of, of botnets and, uh, and how to, you know, uh, get money for spam campaigns or something like that. It was basically, it's, it's how the business uh, side of this thing apparently works. Right, yeah, Krebs had done a really interesting write-up yeah. about this. I, I talk about Krebs a lot, but he, he did an interesting write-up about this that you, you guys should all read, where he was analyzing, um, not from a spam perspective, but from a back-end perspective of all these affiliate programs. You know, unfortunately, the affiliate programs, a lot of them compete with each other. So, like, bad guy A group wants to, like, discredit bad guy B group so that they use one service over another. So they leak the database of one of the competitors to Krebs. They're like, oh yeah, here's a bunch of data, go and like blog about it. And what he found was that the top three affiliates were all the same dude. So like the top three money earners for Spamit, you all use the same like web money ID, and they were all the Rust dot guy. So like he would register like multiple affiliate accounts and manage to be the top one, two, and three affiliate for these huge spam campaigns. Um, and just make boatloads of money. But he didn't want to be too big, or else everyone would get pissed at him, like, oh, who is that one username? So he would, like, register multiple accounts on all these services and still be the top earners for all those different accounts. So it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. 
So um, anyway, so over Christmas, uh, it, it, uh, the botnet just stopped for a couple of days, about nine days, or however many days that is, about two weeks or something. And nobody knows why. And, and last I heard, nobody has found out yet. So for all we know, the operators were abducted by aliens for two weeks. I don't know. But uh, anyway, this is, uh, if you look at the statistics, you can see the, the drop, like right over Christmas vacation. Yeah, Rustock's always had an interesting spam pattern that's a little bit different than all the other bots in that it's not like, fl like continually sending spam the way some of these things are. It sends like, like massive amounts of spam in spikes. So like one spam run, and it was, it was it, because it is implemented at the kernel level, it was more efficient than a lot of bots. It was able to send a lot more spam. Um, similar to like Sprisby, which is another similar fairly yeah. sophisticated rootkit. Um, it, it's able to send it much more efficiently at a much lower level, um, which is why you see those peaks, because it doesn't need to send it over time. It has enough bots that it can just pump out everything at once. And it's a little harder, too, for the anti-spam vendors to catch up if you send it all at once instead of over the course of a couple hours. Right. So um, anyway, other things that it started using over, over uh, in the last two or three years was um, going to a, a random DNS name based off the current date type of backup mechanism. So uh, the next time you, anyone tries to uh, you know, shut down all the CNCs, it, it, was still, uh, it would still be recoverable if you get the DNS names. Um, it did a bit, of, a bit of encryption, not, not very well. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about a lot of the, the, uh, the CNCs, besides being uh, uh, a lot of the DNS being fast fastplex, is the, 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 the A record would have the wrong IP address in it, or rather it would have a, a transformed IP address. So if you, you ask, uh, what is, uh, hang on, like what is the uh, IP address for uh, holybible.com or whatever? And it would it'd send you back out with one, two, three, four, and then Rostock would take that and transform it to the actual IP address and connect to that. Uh, with the appropriate uh, headers being faked for it and so forth. Um, so the, let's see, this one was the, uh, this was like the, one of the main, uh, or this is like the main incoming uh, DNS name for most of uh, earlier this year. Yeah, so a lot of times this name would never exist. So it would do, it would do the lookup on like some other domain name, we'd get an IP address and then we'd connect directly to this. But like for the, for the most part, this domain name, if you were to look it up directly, never connected to anything. Um, but what, what was interesting about the way they kind of changed their communications, and like, you'll see this throughout the, def the different steps of their infrastructure, they're trying to fool different types of people in the different ways they do obfuscation. So again, in this case, they're going after the network guys. You know, if you're a network analyst and you're looking for st statistically strange URLs or URI calls or maybe strange headers or user agents or something like that, they embedded a, a proper user agent they had a full HTTP header instead of just like very small chunks that some people will, because you know, you can get by with just like a get or a post and then a host header. So like that's all you need for HTTP to work. But if you look at what a browser has, it's like accept language, accept encoding, you know, uh, pragma, all, all that garbage. So they, they added that all, all in even though they didn't really need it. And better than that, they actually made all their posts, all their connections, look like you were logging into a message board and posting to a thread. So they copied the format that you use for, it was like, it wasn't PHPBB, but it was one of those yeah. like popular PHP-based bulletin boards, and they embedded their command and control in those, in those, in those URLs. So again, you know, they could have easily not done this. They could have done it on something that was easier for them, but they specifically did it this way to, to not just make people say, ah, I can't tell if that's good or bad, but if you see this, you're like, oh, that's a message board post. That's obviously legitimate. So like, you go in the other direction of thinking it's completely legit. Um, so that's why they're able to stay around and be the biggest and baddest for, for so long. Um, anyway, oh, so the other, the inner, in, other innovation around this time was they switched to a, to a multi-tiered command and control structure so that uh, basically the, the, uh, all, the vic all the bot machines would uh, talk to you about, at the, around March by about 96 uh, CNCs. And then behind those, uh, well, basically this is, whoops, these are the ones you, you, everybody could see because it's what the bot, bots are talking to and all the GTS points do. But behind that, there was some other set of CNC servers that was essentially sending instructions out to these. And, and these are, are uh, not visible, so to speak, from this side of, of the world. And uh, the, uh, 
the other thing about this though is if you if you take down is that if you're going to do a takedown, you need to like get this in, this entire tier, uh, or else uh, if you if there's even one control server left, uh, all of the bots can be updated because there's still there'll still be one responding to it, and uh, this this kind of structure also lets the uh, the operators. Uh, essentially, the, control server, the command and control servers end up being very uh, ephemeral, so that uh, even if they go down, it's, re it's probably much easier, uh, really easier for them to bring another one up, since there isn't really any smarts on, on this layer. Uh, and so, yeah, if they, they do go down, they usually start doing the DNS name lookups. Uh, there was one static name and then a bunch of algorithmically generated ones. So, uh, other changes, it, it, it started using uh, SSL for doing the SMTP. Uh, around the end of 2009, and it stopped in 2010, probably, well, originally, initially, probably because uh, uh, a lot of heuristic spam uh, classifiers will give uh, an incoming message a higher score if it, if it comes in transported over SSL. And uh, then by early 2010, I guess, they, or for some, they stopped doing that, um, possibly for performance reasons, because if you don't have to do the whole SSL handshake, it's probably a lot faster to send, pump out million, billions of emails. Uh, they also actually used, uh, they actually go through Hotmail's web interface, too, if the uh, um, user had creden credentials for it. Uh, the DNS was uh, fast flux between a whole bunch of servers, like you say, and uh, it also, uh, to try and bypass a lot of heuristic uh, spam classifiers, it would, it would uh, grab random uh, uh, strings off of uh, Wikipedia uh, through the through the random page interface, and uh, if you look at some spam messages, it's basically uh, you can see how the f the uh, the forms kind of work. Is the uh, the from line is uh, basically you know four digit number with some other stuff that you know a bunch of DNS names probably pulled out of the uh, the uh, recipient recipient email list or something like that. Then the uh, whatever plus the random text from uh, Wikipedia. So sometimes it, it doesn't quite make any sense, you know, they, like that or whatever. But uh, anyway, it's enough to like bypass a lot of simple um, classifiers, I guess, or at least keep the, the score low enough to uh, sneak by. So, uh, so by, by uh, late, 2000, uh, 20, late last year, 2010, and early this year, uh, all of the CNCs for Rustock were were all but two of them were host, actually hosted within the United States, uh, and the other two were hosted in uh, Amsterdam, and uh, you know like places in, like in Kansas or Missouri and uh, you know Kansas, uh, and uh, there's some down you know Bay Area and so forth. Went down in Texas or a couple down in Texas actually. There's there's about was it nine uh, hosting providers I think it was. Six or six seven, or seven something, something like, that. like that. Yeah, but you yeah. Know, the, the key is that again, like if you go back to the old days, like you can really see Rustock evolve throughout the years as kind of the security community has evolved and how security tools in general have evolved. You know, it went from you know IRC communication to hard coded IPs for command and control to this random domain generation, and now they're they're using um, network based. Net, net, inferences they're building into the network communications to, again, throw people off the trail. So just like APT, like sophisticated malware did this a few years ago, now you're seeing it built into truly commodity malware or malware that's not targeted and not, not, not advanced or whatever. So like in the old days, and, and today certainly, if, you're, <clears throat> if you get hit by APT, the first hop isn't going to China, right? It's going to a server in some nondescript place in the US. Maybe it begins one more time, and then it goes back to China. Well, spam bots are starting to do that too. Right, so they, they pick servers in possibly the most, um, I don't want to say nondescript, but I, the only thing I can think of is like, that, like the Saturday Night Live routine with, uh, with Vice President Biden when he talks about Scranton, Pennsylvania. So they bought a bunch of servers in Scranton and used that as like a big command and control point. And they bought a bunch of servers in Kansas City. And they, like these places that, there's not, nothing wrong with Scranton, Pennsylvania, but it's, it, it's not just that it's not suspicious, it makes you think that it's completely legit. You know, if you see traffic going to Scranton, you're like, yeah, that's probably legit. Like, what bad could possibly be going on there? Um, so just really, I don't know, you see, like, they, they built so many things into it that make you think it's legit um, instead, of, yeah. instead of doing it the easy It's way. like, yeah, somebody's, somebody's posting a message to holybible.com and hosted in Scranton. Yeah, ho yeah ho Holy Bible yeah. in Kansas City. Seems legit, you know? <laughs> So uh, this is actually this slide skipping ahead a little bit, but uh, this is 
skipping ahead, uh, Microsoft, this is actually where, where most of the uh, uh, victims were uh, based on uh, research that Microsoft did. So yeah, so the, so the way they did this, uh, we'll talk about the takedown, obviously, but the the way they uh, the way this was generated is Microsoft used a bunch of legal mechanisms, which we'll talk about, to seize well, uh, yeah, 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 certain certain domain names and then sync hold the domains. So then they were able to see. Oh, this was actually before they did that, though. No, wasn't it? Yeah, it's from the sinkhole. Oh, this was in, this was in the court filing. Oh, oh, whatever. So in uh, so March. So the uh, so Microsoft uh, filed a bunch of uh, um, court papers to uh, basically get the uh, the U.S. federal marshals to go and physically seize the Rust, all the Rust CNC servers that were hosted within the U.S. Uh, and they they I don't know precisely what they did in Amsterdam, but uh, in any case, so. Uh, yes, yeah, so it is simultaneous. It is all done like within an hour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so we actually we. Yeah. So the, the Microsoft DCU guys, they have this whole department that's basically set up to, to like bring the hurt to bad guys. Um, and they, they kind of approached us and they said, you know, what do you think not just it would, be, would be able to be taken down, um, but is causing a lot of harm to our customers? And from where we stand, you know, we, we make a, a product that, that detects malware. Rustock was like the, not just the most prevalent, but, uh, but it was causing like a very easily measurable amount of harm on the internet. You know, like if you go after like a, a banking Trojan or like a, a DDoS bot, it's sometimes hard to come up with a metric to figure out if it was actually successful. So with, when they, or when, you know, when anybody wants to go after something, you want to you measure, you want to measure success. So they said, you know, what, what do you think you could provide us some intel on that would help us um, you know, both validate what they were seeing and from like a third party security company perspective, you know, just, uh, just, just basically give us your input. So we put together um, a set of monitoring tools where we were feeding them all the command and control servers that we are seeing on a daily basis. And obviously they have their own research teams that are extremely bright, but they, they wanted some validation from someone not associated with Microsoft that what they were seeing was both right and it was the whole picture. You know, like what Julie was saying, if you take down, so they had like 96, I think, first level command and control servers. You miss one, you know, they can very easily push out an update and really kind of screw a lot of, a lot of the work that you did. So they came to us and they said, you know, what do you, what do you think? You know, is Rustock something that you could help us with? And we said, yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, so they had us write up a declaration of, you know, the, the harm that we thought it was causing their customers and some of the, you know, just, just generic badness we were seeing on the internet. So we did that and we filed it actually in February. Um, and this should all be public. We filed it in February yeah, it and the, the judge said, well, what, what are you asking me to do? Like this is, this is completely outside anything I've, I've ever asked someone to do because you, we were basically saying, hey, uh, all these bad guys are doing bad things and all their servers in the US. But they're not really their servers. They're the servers, like if you think about the way a data center model works, you know, that's typically either rented servers, it might be co-located, you know, co-located where you physically ship a server to some third party location and you're just buying transit, but you're basically asking the, the court to tell these third party providers to turn over access to servers that they may or may not own. Like there's just a lot of like kind of strange mechanisms. So uh, he said, you know, come back in a few weeks and I'm gonna reread this and I'm gonna, you know, make a judgment. So that's, that's what happened in, in uh, a little bit before this in March, the, the judge finally said, yep, okay, and there were some law enforcement people there, but we'll, we'll talk about the technical yeah. stuff. So, um, uh, so the Microsoft's name for this was uh, Operation B-107, uh, following a same, similar uh, sort of uh, methodology and uh, naming scheme as uh, Operation B-49 last year, uh, which took down uh, Walladeck. And uh, in that case, they just, they just uh, took over the entire DNS infrastructure, essentially con uh, administrative control over the DNS names. And that was uh, enough to basically uh, redirect the, uh, the botnet into the, uh, to Microsoft sync holes. But uh, this isn't but, applicable for Rostec, obviously. Just one, one more quick note on that. So, the, that. so most of those domains existed inside the .com and .name space. And it's not just that a registrar or a registry, so like right, the, the way DNS works is you have registries that are responsible for CCTLDs and GTLDs, and then you have registrars who essentially resell those. 
and sometimes you have a shared model. But it's, it's not that some of these registries, and in particular this one was in the US, it's not that they didn't want to help out, it's that they you know, weren't exactly sure whether they had the, the legal authority to help out. You know, this is sort of the, the coordinated takedown is sort of a, a new model that, that security and, 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 and the ISP community are sort of working on. Um, but in, yeah, in, like what Julie was saying, in that case, the, the DNS infrastructure wasn't gonna be enough because they had some IPs hard-coded and you couldn't just take out the domain names, which is what happened in WalletAck and it's also what happened in, uh, in MegaD where we happen to have good relationships with other registrars, um, and they essentially just gave us the names, which was very nice of them. But, uh, but that's the first, I think, legal mechanism that, that anyone's used to, to take domains. Right. Um, anyway, so, so uh, legal counsel at Microsoft, uh, Richard Bosevich, uh, came up with this great idea for, for how to do this. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's an interesting um, clause in the uh, Lanham Trademark Act uh, that I probably should have quoted here, uh, that, that basically uh, allows, uh, allows um, anyone who owns a trademark to seize counterfeit goods. And so basically the legal argument that was made was that uh, these CNC servers had spam templates uh, that claimed to be from Microsoft or from Pfizer selling Viagra or whatever, and uh, that's a trademark infringement. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're selling counterfeit Viagra and, and whatnot and stuff like that. And so, uh, so basically it's under the jurisdiction of uh, this Trademark Act, and uh, all of the CNCs are also within the U.S. jurisdiction, so this still applies. And uh, the, uh, there was a lot of victims in the U.S. also, and so basically the, uh, the jurisdictional uh, uh, requirements have been satisfied. As well, uh, the the actual uh, the the actual uh, request that Microsoft made is kind of written like this. Basically, it says, uh, you know, all your servers are belong to us, kind of. Uh, anyway, it's basically, uh, you know, take over the whole thing so that you know the, the operators can't uh, do anything else. So after they actually uh, seized the hard drives, they did actually confirm that uh, uh, there are spam templates claiming to be from Microsoft and Pfizer on there. Not really surprising. Uh, these are the uh, these are the seized hard drives in question. Yeah, so it's not it's it, so I I I do want to be clear because like some of the press got it wrong originally. They weren't like they didn't seize the servers as like any sort of punitive damages. They were granted temporary access to the servers to get any sort of forensic detail that might exist on them so that they can go off the bad guy, right? And and that that's still ongoing. But certainly, if a bad guy doesn't think or he thinks the servers are pretty bulletproof, and these were up for like a year and a half, so there's a reasonable chance that he thought that he was pretty well protected, so he might have made a mistake such as connecting directly to it, like SSHing right to the server, or leaving things on it, like leaving a code base, maybe he's compiling something, you know, leaving code artifacts, leaving things inside the actual, the server side of the command and control um, that's never meant to be seen by a person, you'd never see that. Um, so that was the idea in going after the hard drives. And then obviously just kind of a shot across the bow to the, to the criminal himself. So, uh, um, but yeah, it's, but when, when you do something like this, like you have to show damages, right? That that's why I couldn't just sue, I, I couldn't do this myself, right? Because I don't, I can't show any damage from the spam. But there's a whole bunch of other damages that that uh, Microsoft is able to show, other than trademark infringement, um, and they're kind of interesting ways. So one of them is the Hotmail service. So they they didn't like actually go out and calculate this, but there's a measurable loss in CPU power and heating and cooling because these, these spam bots were sending fraudulent mails to Hotmail addresses. So Hotmail had to deal with this anti-spam capacity. At one point, this is like 50% of spam on the internet. So this is not like a small amount of spam. So it's, you know, Hotmail has all those problems, but if you think about a corporation, you're buying like, I don't know, so you're, you're a 10,000 person company, you have to buy like Cisco Ironport anti-spam you've gotta buy like more capacity than you actually would have needed if Rustock didn't exist. So there's very real damages that, that corporations could show against this. Um, but more than that, what I think is the, the brand damage malware does to Microsoft. You know, if you ask like anybody who uses a Mac, except for maybe some of this community, but if you ask like your, your parents or your friends, why do you use a Mac? Oh, well Macs don't get malware. You know, I don't get these, I don't get these problems. Like, well, it's, it's, they're not any 
you know, the security is like a totally another thing, but the, the, the fact that malware is prevalent on Windows computers is like one of the major reasons. And it's, you know, it's, it's the, the brand damage there is incredible from this, this type of malware. Yeah. And uh, this was actually, because uh, I messed up when I was doing the slides earlier this morning. But uh, the, other, you, you, the other uses for this you can see was there was also uh, Tor exit nodes on the, uh, on the CNCs, and there was also a number of attacks against servers in Russian IP space that were, being origi they were originating from the CNCs. Right, yeah, so they're creating basically Tor bouncers on these command and control servers that they were using themselves as another means of misdirection, right? So that's, that's something they can give to their upstream providers, that if something bad comes out of these servers, they say, oh, no, I was just hosting Tor. It must have been someone else. You know, ah, it wasn't me. But, you know, they're just, they're really good at, uh, at the different ways of misdirection. Right. So uh, since March, um, there's kind of a, well, um, there's, a, there's a couple of su suspects uh, that, uh, that were um, pulled from the Spamit database, actually, that was, that was leaked. Um, Cosma 2K is apparently the handle, but the, the, the name behind it may or may not be Dmitry uh, Sergeev or... Uh, one of these other ones are Sergei Segev, which is like John Johansson in English. Uh, it's a fairly common name, too. So it's, it's like sort of like uh, going after somebody named John Smith. But a uh, funny thing, uh, Brian Krebs did a bit of uh, research on this. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the hosting uh, providers, he uh, contacted, uh, Brian Krebs contacted, and uh, the, the operator of the botnet hadn't, been, hadn't paid their hosting bill, and so the, the operator was, was, was happy to like, uh, you know, say who, who they, uh, who'd uh, purchased this, uh, this uh, hosting service. And uh, there was a, uh, it was basically a web money account that was a, uh, a confirmed verified one, which basically involves going to some physical office in, uh, somewhere in Russia and showing a picture ID. Uh, and the, uh, the name associated with that was uh, Vladimir Alexandrovich Shergin. Uh, and uh, one of the funny th things that he that, uh, Krebs discovered was the uh, resume for, for one of these people. And it's, there's some kind of really, really interesting things written in here. Uh, I mean, besides, you know, University of Belarus kind of stuff like that, but there's like, uh, like right, right here in the middle, it, it says that, uh, the, that, uh, that, that uh, this, this person's an expert in the field of installations, whatever that means. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so let's see. Uh, also, uh, since March, uh, Microsoft's been doing the due diligence to try and get a hold of the, uh, the people whose property they seized. Uh, they've been running uh, full-page advertisements. In, well, they tried to, to email an ICQ like every every con means of, uh, of contact with these alleged people who, uh, that they could think of. So far, nobody's, nobody's responded, but uh, uh, funny, funny about that. But uh, the, the uh, uh, anyway, the, they've been running a, like quarter page advertisements in a couple of uh, like two newspapers, like in St. Petersburg and Moscow or something like that. Uh, the advertisement or the uh, things here is basically saying, uh, hey, we seized a bunch of servers and IP addresses. If they're yours, uh, please contact us if you want them back or something, anything. Uh, this is the, uh, I mean, Well, the uh, pe people laugh, but, like, one of the big it's things just, that, uh, that, you know, Microsoft's kind of like the man, you know, this big, big, huge company. So you get all these, like, security naysayers who are like, oh, yeah, well, what if they had actually, you know, accidentally taken a, a server away from a good guy, you know, or the bad guy was just using it. It's like, you do a lot of reconnaissance ahead of time so that you don't do that. And, like, these command and control servers, you... It's not like, you, like, if you look at any big CNC, these things are controlling, like, I don't know, like 10,000 bots at once. Like, you can't do that on a regular Joe, Joe Blow hosted platform, right? They, they had, like, 100 servers that were full dedicated hardware. It was very apparent these were dedicated. These weren't shared servers. Um, but obviously, no one complained that their stuff was accidentally taken down. It's just, yeah, this, if you're careful, it doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I, I find this quote hilarious. It's from the... Uh, from the uh, uh, the uh, court update, that uh, no customers of the IP addresses in question or the domains in question have requested that the IP addresses and domains be reinstated. Because, anyway. So, uh, 
Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, from Microsoft's sinkhole, the, uh, the number of uh, bots has actually been declining. Back in March when this was done, it was about one and a half million, and now it's about half of that. So it's, uh, I guess it's, uh, well, two data points, it's hard to say if that's linear or exponential, but. Yeah, you know, measuring, measuring bots by source IP is like a, just a pretty bad way to do it, especially when you do it over more than the course of the, a couple of days. So if you get 1.6 million hits over a week, you know, it's pretty fair that it's around a million. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm can't remember if there's, there may be a unique identifier in this case. I've forgotten. Not that we'd have. This one. The sinkhole would, but. Yeah. Uh, anyway, similar techniques were used for core flood back in like May or June or whatever it was. Anyway, so the uh, so this is what what global spam volumes look like. Yeah, so this is, this is via the CBL guys who do a really good job of tracking um, bots based on handshakes of their of like the the mail agent. Like they, they actually all have unique handshakes, kind of either based on time or based on headers. So the CBL guys, and I, I don't think it's public who they are, so I won't say who it is, but they do a really, really good job. And you, so they, they were tracking Rustock, and so the left is over one month and the right is over one week, and you just see it completely flat lines. Um, it just stops, which is where the takedown happened. Um, but the spam cop guys, who I think are owned by Cisco, um, that's what all the big green spikes are. And then when the spikes stopped, that's when the bot went down. Um, so we think it was pretty successful because, I mean, spam is, you know, in general on a downward swing, especially direct to MX spam as opposed to spam via stolen accounts. But uh, I don't know. A lot of people say takedowns don't work, but, and I kind of showed at the beginning how you can screw it up if you don't really understand what's going on. But when you're working with, the courts and registrars and registries and ISPs and companies that are willing to spend a ton of money on this, which I have to imagine Microsoft did. Work, I work with these guys for like a year. I can't imagine the number of billable hours they, they, they were charged, but um, it can work if you, if you go at it the right, the right way. All right, so um, I guess shout outs to everybody. So um, basically a lot of people worked on this. Um, uh, Microsoft did, a, did the bulk of the work, I think. Actually. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Microsoft guys obviously get, deserve all the credit. All we did was just provide them with the daily list of CNCs to help them validate their own internal research. Right. Um, but they had a bunch of people write declarations on behalf of them. And we didn't even really talk about the Pfizer stuff. But Pat Ford who in, in, at Pfizer actually bought a bunch of the drugs. He got, like, fake, or he got real credit cards and bought a bunch of the drugs and had them tested. And... And there was a 60 Minutes thing where Pfizer was, was highlighted. And there, were, there was any range from like a pretty good knockoff of the drug to just garbage, like just filler, to the wrong thing. Like instead of getting you know, Viagra, you get heart, you know, like blood pressure medicine. Or you get Viagra mixed with penicillin, which is kind of like, you know, you might not, it's actually a pretty good marketing idea if you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's. There, but there's a really good 60 Minutes episode about that that you should check out. But, uh, but obviously, uh, a lot of the earlier stuff Julie had mentioned, uh, Joe Stewart did on, and mm -hmm. Brian Krebs. Everyone does a good job with this stuff. So. Yeah. Um, and also, as a footnote, I forgot to mention earlier on the, on the hosting within the US in Amsterdam, is another possible reason is that uh, the US and Amsterdam have very, very good network connectivity. And if you're uh, you know, ta continuously talking to about uh, you know, one and a half million machines, you need enough infrastructure to, to handle that much bandwidth. Uh, I was actually going to do the math and calculate about how much bandwidth is actually needed if I didn't do the math. Yeah, I mean, but try to imagine a corporate network that's a million and a half computers. Like, I, except for like some sort of like DOD network, I don't know what would possibly have that many systems. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. all right. Any questions? Yep. One. One. Okay.